What's up everybody, Dr. Rossi, Shrinks and Sneakers.com. So in this video, what I'm gonna do is talk a little bit about the mental status exam. So I'm gonna take you down my mental status exam template that I have in my notes as well as the one that I sort of have in my mind when I'm going through discussions with patients and I'm trying to note the specific things in the mental status. One thing you're gonna see with the mental status as you practice, as you get better, as you progress as an intern, is you're gonna to start to see that a lot of the things in the mental status exam are actually things that you're already observing when you're working with the patient and having your initial psychiatric encounter or interview. And there's a couple of key pieces that aren't you, that you normally would not say get from a regular conversation, a regular history with the patient. And those things usually center around testing the person's memory, concentration. Those are the kind of the two areas where, you know, we don't really get that information any other way other than asking the person to do something like a three object recall, do serial sevens or spell the word world backwards to assess concentration. So with that said, I'm gonna go ahead and get started on the video. If you haven't already done so, please like and subscribe to the channel and we'll continue making content related to your psychiatric training and journey. Give you guys an introduction to the mental status exam, which is very, very important. So the mental status exam in psychiatry can be sort of thought of as our objective measure of our patients, right? So in other medical specialties, they have things like laboratory tests, they have things like imaging studies, and we have this great mental status exam. Now, if you look at some of the things that are listed here, majority of this stuff is going to be gathered when you're doing and conducting the interview, right? You're going to be able to observe the appearance of the patient. You're going to have a good idea of what their behavior is during the interview, how their speech is. You're probably going to ask what their mood is, the affect you're going to observe. I mean, all of these things, with the exception of the memory testing, is largely going to be observational during the course of the interview. Now the memory stuff, I will generally stick with just some basic things like a, assess their general fund of knowledge, do a, a quick and dirty five minute three object recall, and test their concentration. If I suspect uh, somebody has a neurocognitive disorder, then I will use either a mini mental status exam or a MOCA. So that's the Montreal Cognitive Assessment um, test on them, which will give us a better idea of what's going on. Again, these are these are still things that are not 100% diagnostic of neurocognitive disorders. They just help us to see that whether or not the person is impaired. The other test that could be useful and it would be what's called a mini cog. And essentially the mini cog is just a three object recall along with clock drawing. So those seem to be very specific um, and sensitive tests for uh, neurocognitive disorder. So if you don't have a lot of time and you really want to just kind of see is there some neurocognitive issue going on here, doing the mini cog could be uh, an easy and quick and dirty way to do that. What you'd like to do also is get PDF copies of these things. They they're exist out there, so it's no big deal. You can, you can find them everywhere. The mini mental status exam is a paid um, exam. So that one, like if you're documenting it, you might... You know, again, you might want to make sure your institution pays for it. The MOCA is free and the MINICOG, I believe, is free also. So let's dive into this mental status exam and just chat a little bit about what, you know, we're doing here. So appearance, uh, very self-explanatory. You're looking to describe prominent features of the patient's appearance that would help another clinician to understand a little bit more about why you're thinking about a particular diagnosis or what your thoughts are on this patient. So I'll give the example of the schizophrenic patient who it's 99 degrees outside, it's the middle of July, and that person is wearing a bubble ja winter jacket, you know, long pants, a, um, a, you know, a hat, like a wool hat, gloves, all this stuff that, you know, commonly would not be worn during the summertime and especially not in that kind of heat. So describing those things would be very important in that case because again it gives you it gives a clinician a sense who's reading this documentation of where you're going with this and why you thought this person was so impaired. Now other things that could be prominent you might want to comment on the person's appearance. Do they are they are they uh, well dressed? Uh, is their hair done? Are their nails done? Right. Um, you might want to 
document, uh, you know, are they Caucasian, African American, Hispanic, Asian, male, female, or gender neutral, non binary, whatever the case is, you want to, you may want to document those things. Are they appropriately dressed? That's what we talked about at the beginning. And do they appear their stated age? Often patients with like severe psychiatric disorders like schizophrenia look a lot older than they actually are. You also might want to comment on their body habitus, right? So if someone is, is uh, obese, you might want to mention that because if someone's going to think about prescribing antipsychotic medication, they may want to choose one that does not cause weight gain or causes very little weight gain. So those are the kind of appearance things that you might want to look for. Also distinguishing features such as uh, tattoos, piercings, uh, unique features, unique you know birthmarks, etc. that you think would be relevant for a provider to know. Their behavior, how do they behave during the interview? Are they cooperative with you? Are they uncooperative? Are they like completely indifferent and apathetic during the interview? Do they become agitated when you ask questions? Do they, become, do they look very anxious and fidgety in their seat? It, it's important to kind of document what that behavior looks like. Again, so you're painting a proper picture for people who read this documentation. Their speech, is it a regular rate, rhythm, and volume, right? So we comment on rate, rhythm, and volume. We can say things like it's either pressured or not pressured. That would be important in your bipolar patients. Is it normal? Is it thoughtful? Are they articulate? Are they rambling? That can come with like things like schizophrenia. Are they talking loud, again, with bipolar? Or are they talking really soft and slow? Things like depression. The mood is the patient's subjective sense of how they feel. So that's like the patient says, my mood is depressed. My mood is anxious. My mood is worried. My mood is, I don't know, right? Sometimes we get that too. So whatever the patient says is what you're going to document there. The affect is sort of your impression of the of how the patient appears, right? So is their affect appropriate, calm, pleasant, relaxed, friendly, happy, bright? content? Are they euphoric in the case of bipolar? Are they depressed? Do they look, are they hopeless? Are they discouraged? Do they look anxious, worried? It's sort of your impression and some, and we'll also want to comment to hear whether or not it's congruent or incongruent or whether or not it's appropriate or inappropriate in the context of the situation. The thought process, so are they linear, coherent, and goal-directed? Like, are they are they making a lot of sense? Or are they circumstantial and tangential in the way they, someone might be with bipolar disorder? Do they have flight of ideas, again, with bipolar, bipolar disorder? Are they disorganized in schizophrenia? So there's many different ways you could describe someone's thought process. The thought content, so thought content would be things like, what are they thinking about? Are they thinking about suicide? Are they thinking about killing someone else in the case of homicide? Are they paranoid and talking about paranoid delusions of the FBI watching them and tapping their phones, etc.? So you want to talk, you want to comment on their thought content. The next thing is perceptions, and perceptions would be things like auditory, visual, tactile hallucinations, uh, olfactory hallucinations as well. Uh, commonly in psychiatry, we deal mostly with auditory, but we also sometimes see some of the other ones, like cocaine use can sometimes lead to formication, feeling like bugs are crawling under your skin, and uh, that can be a tactile hallucination. Um, also, olfactory hallucinations, probably more common with things like uh, seizure disorder, epilepsy. The memory testing was the part I said is kind of the one thing you have to do at the end that is not really observed during the course of the interview. So fund of knowledge, I'll ask questions about who's the current president, the past president, the president before that. I might say something like, how did John F. Kennedy die? And, you know, hopefully they say by assassination, things of that nature. So sort of general knowledge questions um, about, you know, major historical events or major newsworthy events that most people would have heard about is a good way to go. Three object recall, you're going to want to pick the same three objects because as the provider or physician, you do not want to forget what you asked the patient to remember, right? So if you say three objects randomly and you don't remember what they are, that can look bad. I usually use the same three. I use ball, chair, and purple. And I'll ask the patient to remember those three. And again, those are my three. So I always know what I'm asking each patient. 
So you're going to tell the person to repeat that. So you're going to see that they process the information, right? The, that they were able to repeat ball chair purple. And then you're going to tell them in five minutes, I'm going to ask you those three things again. Okay, right? So that would be a way of, of dealing with the three object recall. And then concentration can be assessed in a number of different ways. Some people like what's called serial sevens. So this would be taking the number 100 and subtracting seven from it consecutively. Um, so that you can see how, and again, it's, it's kind of difficult to do even for the average person, let alone somebody who's dealing with a psychiatric disorder. So that one can kind of be a little difficult. Many times I will use spelling the word world backwards, W O R L D right backwards, or, um, I will use the months of the year backwards in severe cases. The last part you comment on a mental status exam is on that person's insight and judgment. So you want to say, to the part you want to see, and this is again in your observation and the way you're feeling after conducting the interview. So is generally speaking, people who come to, who end up hospitalized or in the ED, their, you know, their insight is usually not fair. Um, it's usually, or good. It's usually poor, impaired, or questionable. And their judgment is usually also poor, impaired, or questionable, right? Um, impaired, I use for patients who are, you know, severely manic or psychotic to the point where they really don't understand what's going on. With um, with uh, poor, I will use that for like my depressed patients. But again, that's like your assessment of how well they understand things, uh, they understand the context of what's going on and the severity of their symptoms and current presentation. So I'm gonna wrap at this point on this part of the mental status. If there's any questions or comments, you know, drop them below. I'll be happy to answer.